In November 2019, I posted a video in which I played the C major prelude from the first book of Bach's Well-Tempered Clavier in three different temperaments. This is by far the most popular of my videos in terms of views, but its popularity also means that there have been a lot of comments, some of which have also generated their own discussions. While I have tried to respond to as many comments as I could, there are certain issues that keep coming up, and therefore I have decided to make a series of videos in order to address them. Before we begin, let me say that, in general, the topic of temperaments is not usually addressed in traditional music education. Like other aspects of performance that have sadly been standardized, equal temperament is the only temperament many musicians are familiar with. These videos, then, are probably mainly addressed to those who are beginning to explore the rich variety of temperaments outside equal temperament, but I really hope they will also be useful to those already familiar with the colorful world of alternative temperaments. Since each topic I want to discuss requires a bit of explanation, I have decided to make three separate videos. In the first, which is this one, I will discuss temperaments in general, explaining why they are necessary and exploring some of the different aesthetic preferences of earlier eras, which can have significant implications in performance. In the second video, I will offer some suggestions and strategies on how to begin distinguishing the differences between temperaments, and in addition, Following recommendations by several viewers, I will play individual chords and short passages in different temperaments so that the differences will be more readily apparent. Finally, the third video will address the question of, as some viewers put it, what is the point in using historical temperaments? In order to understand why temperaments are necessary, a good place to start is by exploring a distinctive property of pure intervals, which is that they have simple frequency ratios. What this means is that if this A is tuned to 415 Hz, then the A above it will have double that frequency, or 830 Hz. This gives the octave a frequency ratio of 2 to 1. These simple frequency ratios are present in other natural intervals within the harmonic series, so that a pure perfect fifth, for instance, has a frequency ratio of 3 to 2, and a pure major third, a ratio of 5 to 4. Ideally, we should be able to tune all of these intervals pure. Unfortunately, this is not possible. Let me show you why. Let's take this octave from C to C. Within this octave, there are three pure major thirds. C to E, E to G sharp, and G sharp to B sharp. The reason I say B sharp and not C will become very clear very soon. Now, here are the three major thirds. And here now is the octave from C to C. As you can tell, if we tune pure major thirds, the octave is too narrow, and those who are mathematically inclined may have already figured out that this was to be expected since the ratios of 2 to 1 and 5 to 4 are not equivalent. The other aspect of this that may seem strange 
to anyone only familiar with equal temperament is that B sharp and C are not the same pitch. In other words, they're not enharmonically equivalent. B sharp is ever so slightly lower than C. Now, without for the moment getting into another set of challenges that we have to face, let's look at our problem of having an out-of-tune octave. We could actually fix it by raising the B sharp to C. In other words, this is what we have now. I could actually raise this But now, the problem is that we have a diminished fourth between G-sharp and C, in other words, this. Because G-sharp and A-flat are again two slightly different pitches. Perhaps a more acceptable solution would be to distribute the discrepancy between the B-sharp and the C among all three pure major thirds, which means that we could end up with major thirds being slightly wider than pure, but at least there would not be a diminished fourth anywhere, which is more objectionable. But before doing that, we have to deal with an equally serious challenge that arises if we were to tune pure perfect fifths. This may be a little harder to visualize, because if I were to start on the lowest C of my spinet and then go up by perfect fifths, I would need 12 fifths before completing the cycle and getting back to C, and so I would run out of notes. In other words... And I still need a few more. However, what would happen when I eventually got there is that in contrast to the pure major thirds where the octave ended up being too narrow, this time the C would be too sharp. In other words, the octave would be too wide. Because having pure octaves is our first priority, we have to figure out a way to slightly modify or temper the major thirds and the perfect fifths. And it is precisely for this reason that we need a temperament. Throughout the centuries, theorists and musicians have come up with different solutions on how to temper thirds and fifths. Basically, every temperament represents a different set of compromises, and these different compromises reflect the different aesthetic preferences of a particular era. This also means that there is no single ideal or best temperament. Rather, there are temperaments more or less appropriate depending on the repertory we're playing. The history of temperaments is quite complex, and I'm definitely going to be generalizing here, but I think one trend we can detect is a gradual shift from temperaments that favor retaining pure intervals at the expense of being able to play in every tonality, to temperaments that sacrificed most, but not necessarily all, pure intervals, so that all tonalities are playable. And for the purposes of this video, we could contrast two widely known temperaments, quarter comma mean tone and equal temperament, as representing two fairly radical opposites in the continuum between retaining pure intervals and being able to play in all tonalities. I've discussed both of these temperaments in previous videos, but here's a quick overview since I will use both of them for the second video in this series. Quarter comma mean tone aims at retaining as many pure thirds as possible, meaning that we have eight pure major thirds. All these pure major thirds, however, come at a price. 
The remaining four thirds are very wide. One of them, incidentally, is the G sharp to C I demonstrated before. And the fifth between A flat and E flat is extremely wide. Technically, it is really a diminished sixth between G sharp and E flat. And after hearing it, You can probably guess why it is commonly referred to as the Wolf Fifth. Incidentally, there are no enharmonics in quarter comma mean tone, and each accidental key has only one function. So A flat does not exist. There is only G sharp. And likewise here we have an E flat, not a D sharp and I will return to the concept of enharmonic notes later in the video. Especially from our modern perspective, the major disadvantage is that only a limited number of tonalities are playable. However, composers of the 17th century, familiar with the characteristics of quarter comma mean tone, used what may appear to us as limitations for expressive purposes. I will put a link in the video description of a video where I discuss Louis Couperin's Tombeau de Monsieur Blanc Rocher, whose expressive content relies on the use of quarter comma mean tone. Equal temperament goes the other extreme in that it contains no pure intervals. I mentioned before that tuning pure perfect fifths results in an octave that is too wide. In equal temperament, this discrepancy, in other words, the amount of deviation from a pure octave, is divided equally between all 12 fifths, which means that all 12 fifths are slightly narrowed by the same amount. But because thirds and fifths pull the octave in two different directions, concentrating on keeping all fifths only slightly narrow results in major thirds that are much wider than pure. This may not seem like a big deal to anyone used to equally tempered thirds. However, once you have heard what a pure major third sounds like, equally tempered thirds don't sound particularly pleasant, and I will demonstrate the difference between the two in the second video. Finally, since all intervals are equally tempered, there is no key color. All major tonalities sound exactly the same, and all minor tonalities sound exactly the same, which is not the case with unequal temperaments, where each tonality has a distinctive personality. There are numerous gradations between quarter comma mean tone and equal temperament. One of the trends in France, for instance, was to use milder variants of quarter comma mean tone by retaining fewer pure major thirds and getting rid of the wolf fifth. This allowed more, although not all, tonalities to be playable. The Rameau temperament I use for most of my videos is a good example of this type of temperament as it contains four pure major thirds compared to mean tones eight. In contrast, one of the trends in Germany involved temperaments that consist of various combinations of pure and impure perfect fifths, while no major thirds are pure. The only exception to this that I know is the Kinberger three temperament, which retains one pure third but as much as I personally like it, this temperament seems to be an oddity among other temperaments in Germany. Such temperaments are usually called circulating unequal temperaments or well temperaments, and like equal temperament, make it possible to play in all tonalities. And of course here you can see why Bach called his collection of preludes and fugues the well-tempered clavier. What he had in mind was precisely this type of well temperament. The one major difference 
between these circulating unequal temperaments and equal temperament is the one I mentioned previously. Because in unequal circulating temperaments, not all intervals are of the same size, for instance, not all fifths are the same, each tonality retains its own distinctive personality or color. And indeed, the entire notion of different tonalities having individual expressive characteristics depends entirely on unequal temperaments, where every tonality sounds different, whereas in equal temperament, no such difference exists. Finally, I would like to address the subject of enharmonic notes. This is yet another complex subject, but the main point I would like to make basically constitutes a reversal, so to speak, of what we learn in modern music education about enharmonic notes. The concept of enharmonic notes involves two notes that are spelled differently but sound the same, like for instance G sharp and A flat. This seems to make sense instinctively because G sharp and A flat occupy the same key. However, what is really happening here is that, at least in equal temperament, we are compromising by tuning in kind of a midpoint between G sharp and A flat and letting it represent what in reality are two slightly different pitches where G sharp is lower than A flat. Of course, on a keyboard, we're limited by the number of keys that we have within an octave. In earlier times, however, the ability to distinguish between what we consider enharmonic notes and to incorporate that distinction into one's performance was part of musical training, especially when we're dealing either with singers or with instruments like, for instance, the violin, that are not limited in the number of pitches they can produce within an octave. Just to give you a couple of examples, in his book Observations on the Florid Song, published in 1723, Pier Francesco Tosi states, if a soprano sings D sharp at the same pitch as E flat, a sensitive ear will hear that it is out of tune, since the latter pitch should be somewhat higher than the former. And in his treatise on playing the flute, Johann Joachim Quantz states that appreciation of the difference between sharps and flats is needed by anyone who wants to develop a refined, exact, and accurate ear in music. This aesthetic has profound implications for the performance of music from the 19th century and before. Nowadays, we're usually taught that when a composer has chosen one of a pair of enharmonic notes, say C sharp instead of D flat, the choice has to do with which of the two notes makes a passage easier to read. However, judging from what the historical sources tell us, when the context involves singers or instruments that can differentiate between those two notes, the composer's choice seems to have more to do with a particular harmonic color thereafter, and performers are expected to differentiate depending on which note is specified. In terms of keyboard instruments, the further back in time we go, the more we have to come to terms with the fact that, based on the temperament that is used, each key on the keyboard also has one function. In other words, there are no enharmonics. In standard quarter comma mean tone, for instance, the five accidental keys are tuned to C sharp, E flat, F sharp, G sharp, and B flat. The reason for this particular choice has to do with the fact 
that the three sharps, F, C, and G, are the first three sharps we add to major scales, while B flat and E flat are the first two flats. What this means is that the available major tonalities include C, which has no sharps or flats, and then on the sharp side we have G, D, and A major, while on the flat side we have F and B flat major. Playing a scale in any of those tonalities is therefore possible. However, if I go beyond those tonalities, in other words, from four sharps and above, or three flats and above, then something somewhere will sound a little sour. So D major, for instance, sounds fine, However, if I were to play B major, where we have five sharps, then we're missing D sharp and A sharp. And you can tell that when I'm going to get to those missing notes, something sounds a tiny bit off. So here. because the whole steps C sharp to E flat and G sharp to B flat are too wide. This is admittedly a fairly brief overview of some of the issues associated with temperaments and especially the reason why temperaments are necessary. In the second video of this series, I will offer strategies and suggestions on how to listen for the differences between temperaments and provide a demonstration of different chords, intervals, and short musical passages played in different temperaments. However, I hope you can already see how using different temperaments opens up a new world of harmonic possibilities and enriches our musical experience, both as performers and listeners. Thank you for watching.